Not a better place to be than hiding in Jesus. Amen. And we would like the illustration with the bell. For a while there, I thought it was going to be harder to put the bell together than the church. Yeah. <laughs> but you got it together, and I feel good. <laughs> and I really feel good when I saw Bill and Beth come in the back there. Bill, we've been praying for you. Good to have you here. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, speak to us. Amen. 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 Get your Bibles, open with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we're going to be looking at an invitation from Jesus. And then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For the last few weeks I've been studying this text and really thinking about it and you know, the text itself seems rather poetic. And as I've been thinking about it, I'm planning a, a series on this text later this year where we're going to unpack this text word for word. There is just so much in that particular passage. But today I want to focus just on the last two words of follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you think about those two words, and what are the personal and practical implications of those two words to us? Follow me. Here's Jesus. He's offering an invitation to us. And at the end of the chapter, you'll see that he's offering an invitation to three people to follow him. And while we, along with those three, we initially seem eager to follow him, we begin to process in our minds how following Jesus will impact our specific situations, and we immediately begin thinking of excuses. Let's meet the first individual. I'm going to meet the first one today in verse 57. And here he is. He's, he's on this road and he approaches Jesus and the disciples. And as he gets closer, he sees who it is and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. Boy, are those impressive words. He seems to understand what Jesus was looking for. And he certainly knows the right words to say. In those words, he sounds committed to Jesus. He sounds like a follower of Jesus. There's no restrictions, no boundaries, no borders. Simply, wherever. Now I want you to contrast in your mind this man from Luke with the Old Testament prophet of Jonah. Jonah, who was told to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. This man in Luke says to Jesus, okay, I will follow you wherever. And the man in the Old Testament says, no way. <coughs> the man from Luke begins to make excuses and the man in that fishing town excused himself. Excuses. Excuses. That's what psychologists <laughs> tell us that is the number one way that people deal with fear and avoidance. We make up excuses. You ever make up an excuse? We stay away from people and places that make us uncomfortable and that cause us fear, that cause us anxiety. And when Jesus calls us to do something, we say, with all the right words, like the man from Luke, I'll follow you anywhere. But then, 
But then Jesus points to a place and he asks a question. What about there? What about there? Now we can be sure that when he points to there, there will probably be out of our comfort zone. It will be a threat to our comfort and to our security. Out of our comfort zone can be defined this way. The places where saying yes to God means saying no to self. <coughs> saying yes to Jesus, to following Jesus, often means saying no to comfort. Oftentimes that statement, I will follow you wherever, is nothing more than a poetic expression. <coughs> kind of like the husband telling his wife, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. Oh, it's so easy to talk about following Jesus, isn't it? It's so easy to make that general statement without any specific commitments tied to it. But to each of us, following Jesus means making some significant life changes. Following Jesus literally means that you go where Jesus goes. And those poetic words, those poetic words can have such huge implications to us. Like the man from Luke, we may be quick to say to Jesus, I will follow you wherever. But when we change it from a wandering generality to a meaningful specific, when we say to Jesus wherever, and he points to a place and says, what about there? It's probably going to take us right out of our comfort zone. Now some of you have heard my story, and some of you haven't, so you just have to bear with me if you have. And some of you have not heard about when what about there became what about here? The Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Like the man from Luke, I was happy to say wherever until God said there. One of the reasons we don't follow Jesus is that when he says there, we take that more as a suggestion than as a command. So what is my story? Let's see, I was born on June 1st, 19, and then, let's see, I was three weeks early and, I don't know, 10 pounds, 21, 22 inches, I don't remember, so I've always been early and big from age, so into my story. So. But I want to go back to August 9 of 2015. <laughs> Where is she? Oh, yeah. What was August 9, 2015? You don't know. Is there a bridal shower? <laughs> <laughs> What's your wedding date? What about there? 
And I can tell you this, bad question can create sleepless nights. Every night for the next two weeks, I would wake up during the night thinking about the Hamilton Church, so much so that I thought about talking with Ron Henderson about this church, and I just kept pushing that idea back and away. Had no idea that people, other people were referring about it either, but I just kept pushing it back and away. And then Friday evening, August 21 of that year, Ron called me prior to the special constituency meeting on Sunday, and before we hung up, I just kind of blurted out this idea about how I could help the Hamilton Church for six months, and just had an idea, and he said, well, we should talk on Sunday or Tuesday, and that I should remind him. You ever get that feeling of remorse immediately after you've said something you wish you hadn't? I was there. I didn't even tell Darla. I just kept pushing that idea, that, that statement out of my mind, and, and, and I wanted to take it back. And I began to think of making excuses. Those excuses in my mind. And I began running away. I even went to MapQuest to find how to get to Nineveh. <laughs> Sunday came and went, and I avoided talking to Ron. I got, wow, I got through Sunday, and, but I'm going to see him on Tuesday and at the finance committee. And I thought, maybe I should title this sermon, Sundays, it's Sunday, but Tuesday's coming. <laughs> I kept pushing it back. I told myself, don't remind Ron, let him bring it up. And he did, just as I was adjourning the meeting. It's one of those God things where you leave it up to God and the spouse already, Darla already said, what about there? And now God is using somebody else to say, what about there? Well, long story short, we talked, Ron Oswaldo and me, and my offer was to help out for six months, and, and they said yes, except forget the time frame, forget the timeline, and they even told me how they'd been thinking about me, and we, we quickly connected all the dots, and the idea was huge to me. My sermon back in September of that year was entitled, A Whale of an Idea. But not to God. Just saying, I'll follow you everywhere or wherever doesn't create sleepless nights. But when God shows up and God says, what about there, that creates sleepless nights. Now I have to say, I was pretty certain that if I said no, that I was not going to spend three days in the belly of a whale. But I must admit, I was definitely out of my comfort zone. And, and my mind did imagine a few times what the inside of a whale's belly is like. And I wondered, Thinking back to childhood, the pictures we create, did it really fit the description that I had during those years? You know, that, that large, cavernous area with that soft, gooey seating, and the poster was something like leather, and then there was that smell. And I began to make excuses, but, but God, I will, but i got to do this first. And, and I began to create a list of things in my mind but God, I've not been to the seminary, and my education is not in ministry. And then I began to think about all the things I would give up if I did this. My friends, the choir, the music, my ministry in speaking in, in other small churches in Ohio. But then to, to return to the church where I grew up, where some of you knew me, and I knew some of you, we knew a lot about each other's past. But God said, trust me. Trust me. Forget about all those excuses. I'll get you through. And he says, I'll give you new friends. You'll have a choir. And the music, I'll make sure you have more music than you ever imagined possible. And then all that stuff from the past, I'll even give you a broken cistern 
Okay, get rid of the past. I'll give you new water. I'll give you new life. And then God said, I'm not asking you to do something that I haven't prepared you to do or equipped you to do. And that's our God. He doesn't set us up to fail. He has a plan. He has a plan for my life, for your life, for this church. And I think he's been working on that plan for years. We create some diversions, but he's got his plan. So when did he start working on me? When did he start working on you? Well, I can think back to the 90s at this church. Walt Sherman was our pastor. Some of you remember him. He asked me to be part of the youth day, and I was in my late 30s. That didn't quite add up, but he said I only needed a 10-minute sermonette. Wish I could remember what I talked about. Wish I had the notes. All I can remember is I was really, really nervous. Ten minutes. Or maybe it was long before that when in my teen years and back when we had a regular Sabbath school program and I was the assistant Sabbath school secretary and once a month the assistants, it would be their day and, and it was my turn and I would stand at this pulpit and I would, listen, read a three minute report. Or maybe it was much earlier than that, eight, nine, ten years old, Sabbath school, 13 Sabbath programs, learning all the memory verses. I can remember standing over here reciting those from memory. Maybe it was when Walt Sherman encouraged me and groomed me to have a full-length sermon. That was a scary thought. And then another, and another. George, you were around during those years. Some of the others, Judy, Mary. I remember being ordained as an elder, and I don't know if you ever noticed, but somehow I managed in those early years of being an ordained elder, I managed to figure out how to avoid being on the platform and having the main prayer. And then Walt Sherman submits my name to be a member of the conference finance committee, and eventually I became the chairperson, which I still am, and then more committees, more boards, and Lots of experience along the way, managing and chairing boards, equipping me to do something more. And now I'm on the conference the executive committee, the union committee, the division, and the general conference committee, and this is not meant to be bragging at all, but you know, I have a very unique position. I'm probably the only lay person in the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide that serves our church on every level administration and pastors of church too. It's like, what does God have <laughs> Navigating the conference through financial issues and Mount Vernon Academy, you know the story there, and being on the Fort Hamilton Hospital Board, and I was just asked again this week to serve another three years, and then my personal in my career, financial services, national study groups that I've led out in Atlanta and other locations. 28 years of still working as a financial planner, working with people and their money, listening to concerns and solving problems, and you talk to people about money and sometimes you got to put on the marriage counselor hat. The list goes on. God was preparing me for something because I said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to God, I will follow you wherever? It can be difficult to tell Jesus wherever. Believe me, I know. And because Jesus speaks of following him as a journey of risk and uncertainty. And in verse 58 of Luke 9, Jesus replies to the man that says, I'll follow you anywhere. He says, but foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Following Jesus often means we don't know where we'll be going. 
and even if we'll have a place to stay. Saying yes to Jesus, to following Jesus, often means saying no to comfort. Now, well, I suspect that could be a deal breaker for some one of these followers. But Jesus, he gives us an upfront agreement. He tells us that following him won't mean going from town to town, <coughs> staying in the Ritz, and being able to order room service. He's up front. He tells us. It's not going to be like that. And saying, the no, saying no to following Jesus is easier than saying yes. Because along with saying yes comes commitment. And oftentimes we're afraid of what a commitment will lead to. And today, as I look over this congregation, as I look over the choir, you know what I see? I see people that have said, wherever. I'll follow you wherever. I see people who have stepped out of their comfort zone, who have made a commitment to Jesus. And what I also know is that there are some private wherever is among the people in this room. There are personal commitments that some of you made that have taken you out of your comfort zone. And just like the man from Luke, who stands before Jesus and says, wherever, you know, I'm not sure he really understood what he was committing to. And I know I didn't really understand what I was committing to. August of 2015. And I suspect that many of you have experienced the same feelings. But you see, wherever comes in a lot of different forms. For some of you, it may mean driving down from Dayton every week. It may involve knocking on doors of Bible study interest and passing out Step to Christ books. It may involve playing the piano for our growing children's department. It may involve singing in the choir. It may involve working on the physical building here. The list goes on and on where you've chosen to follow Jesus wherever. For me, it meant hospital visits. It meant funerals. It meant baptisms. Lots of responsibilities and duties that came along with this commitment besides doing a sermon. All those words. I will follow you everywhere. Those words have implications. Sort of like the poetic words recited on a couple's wedding day. For better or for worse. For richer or poorer in sickness and in health. Implications. Just like when Matthew decided to follow Jesus. And here's Matthew. He's a Levite, and, and he knew that following Jesus meant leaving everything behind. He knew he was walking away from a comfortable and predictable existence to follow Jesus down an uncertain path. Here's what I know. If you're following Jesus wherever, he will take you towards a sinner that others wouldn't want to be seen with. You'll find yourself among the sick that others try to avoid. And if you follow Jesus, you can expect to find yourself being criticized by some of the quote, religious people in your life and even by some of your family. There are times that you will, you will find yourself being unfairly accused and unjustly treated. And what I can tell you today is this. If we commit to following Jesus wherever, he will be right there with us. He will equip us, he will train us, and he will be with us every step of the way. And imagine with me today, imagine with me a church full of people who have committed to following Jesus 
white pepper. Now friends, today, we all have a story to tell. I've told you some of my story, but we all have a story to tell. This church has a story to tell, a long history. But what I say to you is that it's not a story about me or about you. It's a story about God. We read in Hebrews 12, 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So here's what I know. Here's what I know. When we tell Jesus, I'll follow you wherever, God will take what about there and turn it into what? A story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your invitation to us, to each of us, to follow you. And we thank you for the assurance that you will be with us every step of the way as we make that commitment to follow you wherever. And we want to be ready to say yes when you say, well, what about there? And may we always remember, Lord, that the story is not about us, but the story is about you, and that we will give you all the praise and glory for all the good things that happen. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen.
my story. This is the story of each person here. Our song, praising you all day long. And Father, as we go from this place today, may we have the grace of God and the peace of Jesus to know that each of us is greatly blessed, highly favored, and perfect, but forgiven, and a child of God.